Bismillah. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Allahumma tkhil lana wa li walidina wa li mashayikhina wa jami'i muslimin wa jami'in. In continuation with the last lesson, which is the introduction of this beautiful book, Sharh Hilat Talib al-Ilm. And this Hilat Talib al-Ilm, of course, we know that it was written by Sheikh Bakr ibn Abdullah Abu Zayd, rahimahullah ta'ala. And we're going through the explanation of Sheikh Thameen with some of the explanation and ta'liqat the notes and uh, the benefits from Sheikh Barzaq al Badr Hafizahullah. So as promised, we do a bit of revision. Question number one. What is the benefit of this book? Why did the author, Sheikh Bakr Abu Zaid, author this book? What was it for? Because we mentioned that akhlaq, manners, splits into different categories, right? There's different types of mannerisms. But who was the sheikh? What did the sheikh mean and intend from this book? He said specifically, he meant a specific type of manners. What was it? Because you know there's akhlaq, for example, in how to deal with the parents. There's akhlaq in terms of how to deal with your uh, children and your, and your uh, women folk, your wives. But we mentioned this book specifically is not addressing those categories. So what category is it addressing? This one is interesting, right? And it's time for revision. Move on. Okay, next person. Uh, the seekers of knowledge. Allah. So that's the, that's the answer. Okay? If you don't know this, write it down. The Sheikh, when he intended to write this book and author this book, he, the group of people that he was addressing were the, those that are seeking knowledge. Okay? Those that were seeking knowledge. And then we mentioned what happens to the person that seeks knowledge Okay, and has gained an understanding of knowledge, but they have no mannerisms. Huh? I repeat the question again. The person that seeks knowledge and has mannerisms, sorry, the person that has knowledge and seeks knowledge has some sort of understanding, but has no mannerisms. Two things would happen. What's the first one? He won't benefit to the measures that he should be able to benefit to. Okay, what's the second thing that he's going to be? Yes? The knowledge will be taken from him, taken away from him. Exactly what you said, basically. He's going to be someone that deprives himself of actually benefiting from that knowledge, exactly what you said. And also, he won't be able to acquire the knowledge. Why? Because of the fact that he's going to be of someone that has not adorned themselves with mannerisms. Hurma min barakat, and there's one more thing as well. What else? No. There's one more thing that, that the person that has maybe acquired knowledge but no mannerisms, they deprive themselves of something. So we mentioned the fact that they won't be able to maybe benefit themselves properly. Barakallahu alaykum. So these are the main two things. The first one is they will lose the barakah of the knowledge. The second one is that they, won't be, they will lose the benefits of actually being able to benefit others as well. Because why? what's the reason we mentioned? What did we say regarding the one that loses it? Why would he lose it? Because we mentioned that what? Hmm? He's, not acting. He's not acting. And what happens when someone comes to try to benefit from someone? He looks at the for so because of the fact that they didn't acquire any sort of mannerisms and they didn't adorn themselves with mannerisms then the people won't be able to benefit them from them because of the fact that they themselves did not implement these mannerisms okay the next question we mentioned that that mannerisms is to a high level and what some of the salaf used to compare akhlaq to mannerisms yes you said uh, from some of the salaf saying that uh, mannerism is like uh, so you mentioned that the Salaf they mentioned that in terms of uh, the, the akhlaq, it is a third, okay? Kada and Yakuna Thulutha ila ilm. Okay, now in terms of ilm, what is ilm? 
What is knowledge? We mentioned some benefits regarding knowledge. The removal of ignorance. Removal of ignorance is knowledge. You didn't complete it. Before that, what is it? What's what's knowledge? Quran Sunnah. No, but what's knowledge? Knowledge is worship. Barakallah, that's the main thing you have to understand. It's, a, it's an act of worship. Okay, so knowledge is ibadah, al ilm ibadah. And then exactly what the brother said that it is a means of you removing ignorance from what? And then? And then others. So, of course, others include family members and friends and whatever, and what have you. So, number one, the ilm is ibadah. Okay, ilm is ibadah. Okay, then also we mentioned regarding. That what did the ulama describe knowledge or they use knowledge and they put it in a type of way that we're able to understand how deep this knowledge is knowledge is something by which you can go to Allah okay but the specific statement that Sheikh Bakr Abu Zaid mentioned no he didn't say that but it is but he didn't say that he compared it to something yes so ignorance is disease. No, specifically what he said, Sheikh Bakr Abu Zaid. In the first, this is the beginning of the, of the book. In English, you can find it. Don't look back though. <laughs> this is the beginning. In the beginning, what is what is what is ilm? He said it is something. It's two phrases, and we explained this as well. Is it uh, the thing that uh, you are doing yourself with the... Uh, no. Nope. No, no, no. It's the beginning of the book. We, we mentioned Al-Asl Al-Usul Fi Hadhi Al-Hilya Bal Wa Li Kulli Amrin Matloob Ilmuka Bi Anna Al-Ilm Ibadah Okay? Obviously you have to know that Ilm is Ibadah. But then he mentioned something else. Qala Ba'du Al-Ulama Some of the some of the scholars they mentioned that something, 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 something. No, that is... Uh, Secret Ibadah. Ah, this is what I wanted. Knowledge is what? Okay, and and. And if it's for the heart, the worship of the heart. Very good. So this is what knowledge is. Okay, it's a secret act of worship, comparing it to salah, salat al sirri, wa ibadat al qalb. Okay, and also it is like the act of worship from the heart. Who can tell me a hadith? about the virtues of knowledge. Very good. It's mentioned here that the Shaykh he brought this hadith. Whoever Allah wishes good, uh, wishes good for, he gives him the understanding of the religion. How can you understand this in the opposite form? Yeah, if Allah doesn't want good for someone, then they will be kept ignorant. Very good. And what's the verse regarding, we mentioned, the first thing that one has to always bear in mind when they are seeking knowledge and any act of worship, what's the main thing? Niyah. Your intention, right? It has to be pure for the sake of Allah. Okay, it has to be pure for the sake of Allah. What's the proof? Barakallah <laughs> So this is the proof that Allah mentions in the Quran regarding sincerity. Okay, now, bearing in mind that we said that, what were the two types of showing off that we mentioned? We mentioned there's two types. Huh? Very good. Shirk. Ikhlas. Okay, now, in terms of ikhlas, we mentioned that Imam Ahmed was asked, that knowledge, and I would give you the beginning bit, knowledge, you cannot compare it to anything. If, what was the end of the statement of Imam Ahmed? Very good, uh -huh. and then? Imam Ahmed, he, stayed, he, he, he gave uh, an admonition and a reminder to his students, and he said that knowledge, you cannot compare it to anything and it doesn't come in the same weight scale as anything if if you're sincere and then what, what happened? Complete it. It didn't end there. 
sincere in the Quran to Muslim. No. When he said that, they asked him. They, his companions or his students, they asked him, how can that be, Ya Abu Abdullah? <laughs> Not Raf al Hadith, close, not Raf al Hadith. But he's, he basically gave you the answer. To infer uh -huh. that, uh, to uh, remove his ignorance. Uh -huh. Finish off. Finish off. So you intend to remove the ignorance from what? From the, from the water, from the phone, from what? From, from, from yourself. And then? And then others. Okay, so Ikhwani, please make sure you write down the certain things I say to write down. Write it down because these are like the main points of... Because look, yeah, and one benefit as well, Ikhwani, you know when you're reading a book, the best way that the scholars have advised with regards to reading a book, you can't read all of this. Maybe some can and memorize it all. But when you read maybe two, three pages, the scholar could start stating something from here. Okay, he's writing from here all the way until maybe he gets to this page here. But it's one topic, or one subject. He's talking about a specific point. So what you do, the best way for you to be able to understand what he was talking about, read all of it, okay? You can write annotations on the side a little bit, but make a summarization of all of that with the main points. And then if you go back to your book again, like for example, like for example, if you see here, if you go back to your book again, you would know that this page and this page and this page is talking about these three points. So you've literally made your revision easier for yourselves. There's always key points when it comes to uh, what, the, what the scholar is talking about that, that has authored the book. So always make sure you do that. It helps yourself. It helps yourself when you're going back. It helps you when you're going back. So we will carry on today. Uh, I don't know what page it is. Karim, if you can read from when it says Wan Umar ibn Darrin. After the statement of, 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 of Sufyan al thawri when he says, ما علشت شيئا أشد علي من نيتي. Just after the statement of Sufyan. That's the one, yeah. This one, correct it. It says here, what does it say? Who narrated it? Umar ibn Zab. Okay, the, it's mentioned that the sawab, okay, which is, and where it's taken from, the, the correction, you can find it in Az-Zuhd, li Imam Ahmed, okay? And Al-Hilya, li Abu Nu'im. But the correction is, wa an dhar, okay? Dhar, li abihi Umar ibn Dhar. So it is Dar, narrated from Dar, from his father, Li Abihi, Umar ibn Dar. That's the, that's the correction, okay? Because here is mentioned an Umar ibn Dar. But the correction is Dar, an Abihi, Umar ibn Dar. Okay, so here it's mentioned here. Here it's beautiful. And the, his father's name was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so here it's mentioned, subhanAllah, this bit here. He's asking his father, Ya Abi Malaka ida nas. What is it with you with regards to the fact that when you give admonition to people, they cry. They're touched, they're moved by your words. And if other than yourself gives them admonition, gives them gives them gives them an admonition or reminder, they're not moved, they're not touched. And then what did he say? Read it again in the end. Laysa so like, oh my son. Exactly. So, do you guys understand how deep that is? Meaning, if, for example, a mother loses her child, her cry is from the heart. She's crying from the heart. It's pure. 
There's no fakeness in it. If someone else, and in some cultures they do that, they hire women to come to cry just for the sake of, and it's happened many times in the past, also today. Other women will come and they'll cry, but it's not the actual child. So for example, making it even simpler, the mother is crying because she lost her child. And then her friends comes and attends the janazah. Who's crying is sincere, who's crying is not sincere. There's a big difference. So that's what he's saying here. So he says to his son, he says, look, that the crying, the wailing, or the crying of someone who's lost their loved one is not the same as the one that is hired. I.e. meaning, and the Shaykh Abdul Razak, he mentions here, he says, لا شك أن the one that is, there's no doubt that the one who is giving an admonition from his heart, he's speaking from his heart, is going to reach the heart. So that, that bit, write that down, Ikhwan. He says here, that إذا خرجت من القلب, يعني the موعظة, إذا خرجت من القلب, وصلت إلى القلب. That if the admonition comes from the heart, then it's going to touch and reach the other heart of the person listening. And you can see it. Apparently, for example, you go somewhere and you go listen to someone give you an admonition or a reminder, but he's speaking to you from his heart. It's going to, you're going to be able to reflect and it's going to, it's going to touch home. It's going to hit home. Why? Because he's speaking from his heart, so therefore the hearts are speaking to each other. Almost as if, yeah, and he meaning he's speaking from his heart, so therefore you're going to also be affected. But as for someone else who's just speaking and just reading, for example, you're not going to be moved or affected. وصلت إلى القلب. خلافا إذا كان which is complete opposite if it was what فقط من اللسان if it was just from the tongue. Because it's easy for someone to give you lip service. I can just tell you something. I can just read something to you. But I'm just saying it to you. Different if I'm speaking to you from the heart. So that's the difference. Shaykh Uthaymeen, he mentions here. And he says, explaining, because some people may misunderstand this. He says here that we don't understand by Dar's father that he's meaning he's praising himself by explaining to him why this happens. He doesn't mean that, but rather... He's doing this so that he can explain to his son, okay? And he says that we should think good of the salaf. And why is he doing it? He's doing it so that he can encourage his son to be from someone that when he speaks to others, to have ikhlas and to speak from others from the heart. And that's why, for example, we see in different situations, because you have to understand in terms of ikhlas, that you don't judge a person's intentions just for the, what, that which they say. A person can tell you, for example, it's, it's good for you to memorize Quran like I've memorized Quran, for example. Okay? It doesn't mean now he's showing off because he's saying to you, memorize Quran like I've memorized. He's encouraging you. Okay? So that's the difference. In the Shaykh, he brought the ayah. فَلَا تُزَكُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنِ اتَّقَى The Surah Al-Najm. Okay, in terms of not praising yourself, one should not praise themselves. But that is a quote and for second, who are a lemon bimani taka. Then, then this is a good example. The Sheikh Femini brought an example regarding ikhlas. Okay, regarding ikhlas. The Sheikh he said, for example, the one that seeks knowledge, or you go to an institute where they're going to give you a certificate at the end. There's two categories of people. Or you study in a university or a scholarship or somewhere where you're going to be rewarded a certificate or something at the end. But it's seeking knowledge, ibadah. The Sheikh said people split into two categories. The first one is the one that goes solely to benefit and to get close to Allah. Okay? And then at the end he gets given a certificate. This person, of course, is sincere. The second person can be the one that when he's heard that this is the certificate or a prize at the end, he's doing it only for that. Then, of course, you know that this person is not sincere. And then it could be a third category where a person is seeking knowledge and he wants to seek knowledge or to enroll to that university or institute in order to get close to Allah. However, they want to be able to benefit others as well. So they're thinking ahead. So they want the certificate as well. But what's the purpose of them wanting the certificate? Not to be praised, not to be called anyone, but because of the fact they know that if they go back home or where they want to go and teach in universities, they won't be accepted except with this specific university. Sheikh Thameen, he brings his kalam, and I'm just giving you a summary of that. He says that this is allowed as well. Three types. Three types, yeah. So this is allowed as well. First of all, only to get through the Quran without thinking of the same. Exactly. Second, but it go, the first one goes under the, uh, the, the last one. one. Yeah, it goes under the third one. But it just depends. Some people may just do it for the sake of it. Some people do it because they know that with getting it, 
they could benefit other people. It depends what you need it for. Meaning if you don't salam for it. As a person, you may be someone that you don't need anything after you finish, when you finish the institute or the program. Do you understand? But let's say, for example, you intend to actually use that certificate in order for you to enroll for a, a, a position which will enable you to teach and give da'wah, then there's nothing wrong with it. There is nothing wrong with it. But your sole purpose shouldn't be set out for you to benefit from this certificate. From the dunya purposes. Okay. Uh, if you can read the next number two. Al Khasatul Jamia. Secondly, uh, the comprehensive quality that God guarantees, the goodness of this world and the year after is the love of Allah the Most High. And the love of his Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and realizing them by genuine following and pursuing the tracks of that Okay, so here he says the second point is to that which will grant you the benefits of both this worldly life and the hereafter. And that's why the Shaykh called it Al Khasratul Jami'ah. Okay, meaning it's going to bring about so much khair for you. And it literally is that which controls every sort of goodness, and every sort of goodness goes back to it in the dunya and the hereafter. What is it? Mahabbatullah. Loving Allah Azza wa Jal and loving His Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and implementing it with Tahqiquha, okay, implementing that love, okay, with what? With following the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? Because as Allah says, we do not send him except as a mercy to mankind. And knowing that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was ma'asum, was infallible. So then he explains this, Shaykh Faymin, rahimahullah. He says that without a doubt, and Ikhwani, bear this in mind and realize this, that there is a strong impact that your life will have with regards to that which you love. For example, if I told all of you, let's go right now to this room. Who is going to come with me to this room? But you don't know anything that lies in that room. How many is going to come up? How many people are going to stand up and actually go to the room? Very few. But if you had full knowledge of, what's, of what that room comprises of and what lies within that room and how many benefits there are in that room, I have given you a description, I've given you some sort of uh, knowledge for you to have with that which lies in the room. And after explaining to you about what is in that room, it brings about some sort of love to your heart. Everyone, will, you would will literally fight to get through that door. So, Ikhwani, as it's mentioned, some of the some of the salaf will mention, man la man How can you fear someone or something that which you have no knowledge of? So the same, how can you love someone or love something? If I tell you to love this, but you don't know what it is, you can't. It's difficult for you. You have to have some sort of knowledge. Hence why it's imperative for all of us to have knowledge of our Lord Jalla Jalla, and have knowledge of, of his messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because the more knowledge you have, then the easier it is for you to love Allah Azza wa Jal. So whatever Allah Azza wa Jal says to you in the Quran, or has prescribed upon you, okay, as your Lord, you won't question it. Why? Because of the fact that you love Allah Azza wa Jal. And whatever the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has told us to do within the authentic hadith, then you follow and adhere. You don't question it. Even if you don't understand it. Even if your aql does not understand that which you should do. Because you have muhabba. But that's why Allah says in the Quran, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحِبُّكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَخْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبُكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُرُ الرَّحِيمُ And that's the ayah that the ulama, they say, ayat al-mihna. It is the ayah of intihan. Many people claim they love the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم and they claim they love Allah. But when is the real test? When you are put to test. And that's why, ikhwan, you have to realize with regards to a person adhering to the Quran and Sunnah and being a good Muslim, it's easy for you to say, to understand, to maybe to memorize, but when it comes to implementation, it's for you to actually apply, that's when you get tested. For example, Allah Azza wa says, Fasbiru, be patient. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Those that are tested the most are the Anbiya, then those that come after them and after them. Okay, but then you can say it to someone else. 
when they ring you, oh, akhi, wallah, I'm going through difficulty. And then you tell that person, be patient. But when you are put to test, do you love Allah Azza wa Jal? Do you have full trust in Allah? Do you love the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? I know that this is a test. That's when you need to question yourself. But how is that going to be easier for you? The more knowledge, ikhwani, wallah, the more knowledge that you equip yourself with, the more you know Allah Azza wa Jal. Because as, as Muslims, we go through difficult things. Okay, we go through stages, we go through things that are difficult. But that's why it says here, the ulama, they mentioned this ayah as the ayah of imtihan. Why? Because then when you're put to test, that's when you really realize and know how much do I love Allah? How much do I love Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So the Shaykh Abdul Razak has mentioned here, he said, how, how, many, how many times okay, do you actually follow the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in all of your affairs, your day-to-day -day life? That's what you need to question. That's what you need to really question. How many times in your day-to-day -day life do you do something which the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do? Because of the fact that you know that he is the Qudwa. He should be your role model. And Allah, Ikhwani, for, this is an advice to all the parents. All the parents out there, when you have kids, if you want your children to be upon the Sunnah and to, to love Islam, then you yourself need to be a role model. And that's how the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was with his companion. You see, if the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a person, وحاشة وكلا, of course he wasn't, but giving you guys an example, giving you a picture, let's say he was a person where it was time for them to go to build the Masjid Nabawi, and he was sitting back on the couch waiting for them. And it was time to go for war, and he was sitting down relaxing. How much of a following would he have had with regards to them being ready for them to defend the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It would be a different story. But he wasn't the type. When it came to them building Masjid Nabawi, he was at the forefront building. When it came to them going for war, he was there. When it came to them to do anything, when it came for them, we know the Qissa when Umar and Abu, and Abu Bakr, they left when they were hungry and they had what strapped themselves with. He came out and showed them his all. There was no difference. He was an actual role model in everything. So when it came for him actually telling them, do this because Allah has what? وَعَدَنَ Allah al jannah For example, Allah has promised us Jannah. Be patient. It wasn't difficult for them to actually believe. Because he was showing them, I'm going through exactly what you're going through. So now, why I'm linking that, I'm saying it for the parents. If you want your children to love the Qur'an, to love Allah, to love the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, start yourself showing the love to Allah, to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and being a good Muslim. Okay? التعليم في الصغر كالنقشة للحجر Okay, learning something, the Arab is saying, learning something at a young age, it's like engraving it on a stone. It will never come off. They will just copy. So going back to here, in terms of the Sunnah, it is important for you to know that it's imperative for you to love the Messenger Wasallam and to love Allah. Ibn Qayyim, he mentioned something here, Ikhwani. Write this down in English. I'll say it in English. I'll just translate it straight away instead of saying Arabic. He says that each and every single movement that a person makes, it's built upon love. Okay? And he mentioned this in the book, Radatul Muhibbin. Each and every single movement that a person makes is built upon love. And then he explains it. What does this mean? Because the intent of you intending to do something won't happen until you actually have a love for it. Okay, does that make sense? When it comes, for example, each and every single movement is built upon love. Okay, when it comes to you doing something, you're not going to do it unless you have some sort of a love or ragba or want. That's when you're going to do it. Just like a child. Okay, if you take a child as an example, a child doesn't want to do something, even if you try to convince them to do something, unless they want to do it or they like to do it. So that's what the that's what the, that's what the Imam Ibn Qayyim has mentioned here. And then he says, either they want to benefit from it or they want to protect themselves. So whatever you do is built upon that. You won't actually do something unless you have some sort of energy behind you actually wanting to do it. Otherwise, you won't follow it through. Okay. Otherwise, you won't follow it through. And that's the same. And then Ibn Qayyim, he linked it and he said the same with regards to loving Allah Azza wa Jal. 
how can you follow his that which is prescribed upon you to the fullest if you don't have a lot of love for him Allah tells you to pray five times a day for you to be able to pray five times a day a child for example they will listen to their parents and they'll pray because they see their parents or their parents remind them when they get to a certain age and everyone goes through these phases they'll get to a certain age where they don't actually want to do something so therefore they leave it off until that love comes back again so that's why I mentioned in the beginning what? Cultivate your children upon a salah, upon goodness. Why? Because maybe they'll go through a state where shaitan will drag them or their friends. But because you cultured and nurtured them and cultivated them upon salah, okay, salah as in prayer and also salah as in soundness and goodness, after they go through that phase, they'll remember the good things about that which they used to do when they used to pray because they were cultivated upon that. Okay, so as a human as well, if you have a love, and as an adult, sorry, if you have a love for praying salah because you know the reward, okay, and then you fear the punishment of Allah Azza wa Jal, and you hope for his reward, and you love him, these three things, and that's, that's how the ulama, they used to describe a mu'min, a believer should be like a bird, okay, you have love for Allah, that, that body of the bird is the love of Allah Azza wa Jal, it's going to push you to want to do more. And the wings that keep the bird floating in the air and flying, one of it is fearing Allah's punishment. And the other one is what? Hoping for his reward. So that's how it should be. So the more, linking back to Ibn Qayyim, the more love you have for Allah Azza wa Jal, and love doesn't come except if you have knowledge of Allah Azza wa Jal. So the more knowledge you have of Allah Azza wa Jal, ikhwani, when you read the Quran, how is it that we, some people are touched by the Quran, by the words of Allah Azza wa Jal, and some others are not? Because if you read a statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, for example, it was known as some of the companions they read, ayah, Qulbu Allah ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yurid wa lam yakul lahu ahad. And they will cry. And then you think, cry, why are they crying? Because they understand it. Because they have knowledge of the ayat, of the verses, the explanation. So therefore they're affected. But the less knowledge you have of Allah Azza wa then the less you're going to be affected. Simple example, ikhwani. A person can sit for three hours on their phone, or three hours on the TV, or three hours doing a hobby or a sport. A person that goes and plays football, a young boy that goes and plays football, or an adult that plays football, they will sit four or five hours playing. They won't even know how long they played for. Why? Because they have love for what they're doing. So let's say now you had a lot of knowledge with regards to Allah Azza wa and the deen. Then you would have more love to be able to be patient upon that which you need to learn and also to carry out that which Allah Azza wa has prescribed upon you. And then, Ibn Qay- and then uh, Shaykh Dameen, he mentions, he says, look at those whom hated that which Allah came down with. How did Allah describe them? ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ كَرِهُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ فَأَحْبَطَ عَمَالَهُمْ Because of the fact that they hated that which Allah Azza wa Jal has prescribed, Allah Azza wa Jal put with regards to their actions and he didn't accept any of the actions, rejected it. يعني, meaning that their natija at the end came to kufr, they disbelieved because they disbelieved in that which Allah came with and they didn't like it. So that's why Sheikh Bakr Abu Zaid mentioned it, that it is from the main thing that you will benefit from in this dunya that all the goodness goes back down to is love. So make sure that love for Allah is solidified with knowledge and not jahl. Okay? Because that's when the people that go astray the Sufis, for example, they have a lot of love, but there's no knowledge. That's why it's incumbent upon you to have knowledge. Because knowledge keeps you firm and in the middle. And then we're going to go to the next point, which talks about being in the middle. But before we move on to that, last point I'll mention as well, Ikhwani. It's important for you to know. Actually, before that, the Sheikh Thameen, he said, for example, he gave an example with regards to love. He said that in his time, okay, some of the students of Sheikh Abdur, uh, Abdurrahman ibn Sa'di, okay, Abdurrahman ibn Sa'di, they would copy the way he would write. Okay, they would write the same way that he would write. Sheikh Thameen says, uh, Even though his handwriting, the Sheikh's handwriting, meaning his teacher, Abdurrahman ibn Sa'di, wasn't actually even good. He didn't have good handwriting. But because of the fact that they loved the Sheikh, i.e., his students, so Sheikh Thameen's uh, companions, they copied his handwriting. This is built upon love. And the same way you see, for example, someone could love a reciter, a Quran reciter, for example. You like a Quran reciter, and therefore you try to recite like him. 
even though to someone else that the voice is not that nice but because you love that Quran reciter you want to copy him so that should be the same and that doesn't happen except if you have knowledge or you listen to the person or you educate yourself so you should, we should all strive to educate ourselves with regards to our Lord Jalla Jalal and Ikhwani also with regards to um, children it's important for you and this has happened many many times when you're raising children you have to realize that as a child and Islam the Prophet Sallallahu used to be what Arham nas and he said Man la yurham, la yurham. the one that doesn't have mercy mercy won't be given to them or they won't um, also be shown mercy with regards to children you should nurture them upon loving Islam not hating Islam so children you should give them tarheeb and not tarheeb okay you should give them tarheeb meaning you should tell them if you do this you're going to get this if you do this you're going to get this if you do this you're going to get this if you do this you're going to get this so fill their mind and give them 10 out of 10 options give them eight if you do this you get rewarded and give them one if you don't do this this could happen because you see, look, and I'm speaking Ikhwani, through experience, I know people that have left Islam due to the wrong cultivation. Because of the fact that if you give a child and you say to them, if you don't do this, this will happen to you. If you don't do this, this will happen to you. If you don't do this, this will happen to you. What is that child raised upon? It's a question. Huh? This is what? Say again, Akhi. He's raised upon fear. Islam, Islam does not teach fear. In terms of a child, Islam teaches love and mercy and rahmah. And that's how the Prophet ﷺ was. What does Allah say in the Quran? وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Let alone a child. So if you build your child or you cultivate your child upon punishments and this and this and this, with regards to the deen, we're not talking about raising them or you know their behavior. I'm talking about the deen, specifically the deen, ikhwani. Okay? Specifically the deen. It should be fun. It should be, you know, something that they love. When they're young, they play, they have fun, they get rewarded. So when they grow up, when... Like I said to you, when if they do go, they remember the good moments of Islam. You want to leave a good imprint. So because Allah could take your soul as a father. Let's say you, you've got children and Allah takes your soul at the age of 50 or 40. And now your children are that, that age where, you know, either this way or that way. But because you had a good upbringing and you raised them right, they ended up loving Islam. So that, that's something uh, that's uh, very, very important and we need to understand this. I read the next bit, So the Sheikh is saying, Sheikh Bakr Abu Zaid, that with regards to um, love and loving Allah Azza wa and His Messenger, it is he explained it as a taj, as a crown, okay, literally as a crown. Why? Because of the fact that we explained the reason why, okay. And then he says, "Faya ayyuh tullab, O seekers of knowledge, O seekers of knowledge, ha antum ha ula." Okay, tarabbatum lid dars. Okay, that you literally sat in the lesson. Now you're sitting in the lesson. May Allah Azza accept it from us. That you're sitting in this lesson. And that your intention, of course, you've attached yourself and you've made yourself try to be from those that seek knowledge. Okay, talab al ilm, to seek knowledge. So the Shaykh, he said, he, I advise you, this is the Shaykh advising every reader of this book. For all seekum, wa nafsi bi taqwa Question, why is it the Shaykh is advising, advising with this first advice? With fearing Allah. Why did the Shaykh start with that advice? Why didn't he say, I advise you with good mannerisms? It's a very simple question. It wasn't difficult. Because from the Sunnah, the Prophet Sallallahu that he would start his khutab and other things with the best of advices, which is the fearing Allah Azza wa Jalla. In secret and in open. In secret and in open. 
and that this is the landscape, literally, when it's lands, the landscape of all of that which is khair. Fearing Allah in secret and open, if you're able to try your best to strive to do that, ikhwani, then that is the most, and we mentioned last week, the most important one from the two is fearing Allah more when you're in secret. Because you came into this world alone, ikhwani. Okay? And you will go into the grave six for under alone. And you'll be resurrected alone. And you stand in front of Allah Azza wa Jal alone. Each and every one of us, subhanAllah. May Allah, all, may Allah enable all of us to have a good ending. Because that's the main thing. That you, The more you do in secret, then inshallah that's the better thing. And one of the Salaf, he says that it doesn't matter how many things you do or how many things that you say. If the people have praised you and so many people praise you and speak good of you, but the relationship between you and Allah is not strong, then there's no khair for you. And the opposite, that if your relationship with you and Allah is strong and everyone else speaks ill of you, you shouldn't worry and you shouldn't, you shouldn't care. And that's the main thing, Ikhwani. Why? Because of the fact that you came into this dunya alone. So here the Shaykh is saying that with regards to... Uh, yeah, and this, is, this, is, this will be the Mahbit al fadail Literally, it will be the landscape of all of the khair, all of the goodness. And the praiseworthy, praiseworthy things as well. And it will be the strength, i.e. you being able to have the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal. And it will save you and cleanse your heart and save you from all sorts of trials and tribulations. Shaykh Uthameen, he, he used the verse, write this down, Afwani, in terms of the benefits of having taqwa. The verse is, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, in tattaqullaha yaj'al lakum furqana. Explaining this verse, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, in tattaqullaha yaj'al lakum furqana. O you who believe, okay, O you who believe, if you fear Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah will create for you Furqana. And Furqana, the Shaykh Thameen explains it, saying, أي يجعل لكم ما تفرقون. Allah will make for you that which you're able to differentiate به بين الحق والباطل. Okay? That which you're able to differentiate between right and wrong. Between something that's correct and falsehood. والضار والنافع. And that which is harmful and that which is beneficial. وَالطَّاعَةِ وَالْمَعْصِيَةِ And that which is a good deed and sin. Okay. Shaykh Uthaymeen, he summarizes all of this statement of Shaykh Bakr Abu Zayd by quoting the ayah. And this is the way of the Salaf. They use the ayat to explain things. And the Sunnah, he says that the verse, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu in tataqullah yaj'al lakum furqana. O you who believe, if you fear Allah, then Allah Azza wa Jal will create for you a furqana. Shaykh Uthameen explained the furqana, meaning that which you're able to differentiate between right and wrong. That's the first thing. So you're able to differentiate between right and wrong. Second one, you're able to differentiate between harm and benefit. All of this is going back to, if you fear Allah Azza wa Jal. Right and wrong, harm, harm and benefit, atta'a wal ma'asiyah, okay, doing good deeds, and evil, sin, okay. And also the awliya of Allah and a'da of Allah, and also the enemies of Allah Azza wa Jal, and, huh? Exactly, and the awliya of Allah Azza wa Jal. So these are the things that the Shaykh mentioned. Which surah is this? Uh, uh, this is Surah Al-Anfal. Number 9. Number 9. Um, but the ayah number 29. Surah Al-Anfal, ayah number 29. 29. The Shaykh says that this Furqan it can come by the means of seeking knowledge. Meaning, for you to be able to differentiate between these things, you have to have knowledge. And by you having knowledge, Allah Azza wa Jal will open doors, okay, 
of you understanding sciences and having an understanding and being educated and you're able to actually do things that you wouldn't have been able to do before knowledge before you actually sought knowledge that's one way of you getting the furqan being able to differentiate that's one way the other way so write this down as well the first way is by having knowledge to be able to differentiate between all these things but the main source is what ikhwani fearing Allah the main source is fearing Allah and Allah will grant you these things and how you grant these things the wasila meaning the means yani the actual practical steps that you do is having knowledge or seeking knowledge the second one the shaykh he says by that which Allah azza wa jal will plant in your heart No, no, no. We said the verse in Tataqullah. If you fear Allah, Allah will grant you furqan. Yeah? And then you'll be able to differentiate between these four things that we mentioned. And the wasila, the means, yani the application. For example, akhi, if you want to get close to Allah, عزوجل, you fear Allah, right? If you want to get close to Allah, you fear Allah, you're a good person, you have good mannerisms. How do you actually f- apply that? By having knowledge. So the, so the actual application is knowledge, which you have to go out and do. Okay, so we mentioned the verse is fearing Allah, but the actual wasila, the means that drags you or leads you to fearing Allah, is by knowledge. That's, the Shaykh said that's the first one. The second one is that Allah Azza wa Jal plants in your heart something called firasa, which you're able to differentiate. And I'll explain it to you, Khwani. For example, okay. If someone, uh, if I meet uh, Brother Muhammad, Brother Muhammad, for example, comes to me, and I'm someone that, you know, I can differentiate between a good person and a bad person. I may not have as much knowledge as the brother sitting next to me, and he knows people by when they speak to know whether they're a good person or not, or not a good person in terms of knowledge, right? So he sought knowledge. But Allah Azza wa Jal has given me firasa. What does firasa mean in English? I always forget the name. Firas says you're able to, um, and, uh, if you're able to suss someone out, judge someone, you're able to basically, but just by looking, for example, you, it says it's actually, some, it's actually a, a type of knowledge that Allah grants to some people, not to everyone. It's not ilm al-ghayb, it's not knowing the unknown or unseen. For example, I'll give you guys a simple example. If um, someone was to come to want to take my daughter in for, for marriage, and I have my uncle next to me, he's sitting in the same room as me, and I come and I meet the brother, and the brother, mashallah, look at him, he's got a beard, he looks like a nice man, mashallah. And I say, yep, yeah, definitely, I, you know, I'm happy. And then he leaves, and my uncle says to me, he's not good. I say, what do you mean? It's, it's bay, mashallah, knows Quran, knows. But then Allah has given him firasa, he can read people through that which is apparent. It's, it's, if you look, write it in Arabic, firasa. It's a firasa, fa, ra, sin. So fa ra alif sorry sin tamar buta. Intelligence. It's a type of intelligence. There's a specific name for it. Physio- physio- physiognomy. 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 Yeah, that's it. Physiognomy. So that so that that specific thing, uh, you guys never heard of it. You never heard of it at all. No, you know, you know the word. You know the concept. Okay, yeah, but meaning you know, you know the concept. Yes. Forget the word. The word's not important. The main thing is the concept. But that's that's something that some people have. So another example. Let's say, for example, um, um, we go into a building, me and the brother Tanvir, we go into a building. Can you say six tenths? Huh? Six tenths? Six tenths? Uh, <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. Because <laughs> people may, may, may think something else. Let's say me and Tanvir, we go into a building, and I tell Tanvir, you know what, I want to take this way, this way is good. Tanvir says, no, you know what, he goes, Abdullah, you know what, I don't have a good feeling about this. I don't think we should go here. And then I say, no, no, let's go, let's go. We end up going, something happens to us. Allah gave him the tawfiq and the firasa to be able to actually judge. It's like you're able to judge before, you're able to judge, you're able to read someone, if someone is fake or if someone is two-faced. You know, these are the things that a lot of people, some people, they have it. And it's something that you don't, really, you don't usually learn. You can't really learn firasa, it's difficult. It's either you have it or you don't. Yeah, it's a gift, exactly. Like a basira. Yeah, it's, it's, it, isn't, it is basira because it's an insight. But not basira of ilm, because some people that have no attachment to knowledge, but they have this. And mashallah, they save you through a lot of, <laughs> if you were to take their advice, honestly, they're able to save you through a lot of things. It's just that gut feeling as well, you can say as well. 
but it's not everyone's got it, not everyone has it. So going back, um, and this here is it's reported, in the Prophet ﷺ mentions this actually in Sahih al-Bukhari. Okay, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِيمَا قَبْلَكُمْ مِنَ الْأُمَمْ مُحَدَّثُونَ that those nations that came before you, people who came before you, okay, muhaddathun, uh, they used to uh, do stuff. And fa'in yaka, fa'in yaku fi ummati, and if it was supposed to be in my nation, ahadun, from the people, fa'innahu umar, then it will be umar, then it will be umar, in terms of firasa. Fa'inna Allah yaj'al liman ittaqahu firasatan. يتفرس بها okay. فتكون موافقة للصواب that Allah عز وجل this is something that is actually true if you look at Umar ibn Khattab he was known that he had firasa he was known he was able to quickly suss someone out if you read his tariqh his biography you will see Umar ibn Khattab was like that okay. and then how do we know this as well what's the virtue of Umar exactly وافقه الوحي okay that Umar will say something, will say, say, say something about something, or make a judgment, and the wahi will come down exactly how Umar has said it. So that's what the Shaykh is saying here. فَتَكُونُ مُوَافَقَةً للصواب. That meaning that they would say something, or do, say for example, like we mentioned example of Tanvir, they will say something, and then it would actually be correct in the matter. So this is here, uh, talking about Firasa. But... The meaning of it, yeah, meaning that if it was to be, the Prophet mentioned, if it was the people came before you who had this, and if anyone was to have this from my nation, Ummati Ahadun, then it would be Umar. Yeah, nobody had it? No, it doesn't mean nobody had it, but if it was anyone that would have it, then it would be Umar. But it doesn't negate that no one had it. You understand? So when the Prophet is saying this hadith, it doesn't mean that no one actually had it. But it just means that if it would be anyone, then I would say it's Umar. 100% he has it. Yeah. yeah. I mean it precisely. Not, not more deserving, just saying that if anyone... I'll give you another example. If I say in this room, you know what? Really and truly, everyone here is very intelligent. But if I were to say that someone has an IQ level of 99, I'll say it's Tanvir. It doesn't mean no one has ever had an IQ level of 99. But I'm talking about, with regards to those that are around me, if I were to say it's precisely, it would be you. It doesn't mean no one else has it. But it just means... I'm talking about you specifically. <clears throat> Another example, uh, the firas of Khalid bin Walid, in terms of his judgment with regards to war. He had firas in that. That was a gift from Allah Azza wa Jalla. Not just the fact that he was able to fight, but his firas. And you can see the effects of the Battle of Uhud. So it doesn't mean only Umar had it, but rather it means in terms of that specific moment he's saying that, you know, he's more. Um, the one that he would say that precisely it would be him. So then after that the Shaykh he mentions here That in terms of one that seeks knowledge and fears Allah Azza wa Jal, and Allah Azza wa Jal is able to help, Allah Azza wa Jal is able to help them and open up doors for them from different ways that which they weren't able to actually know beforehand. And Ikhwanu Allah, you see that even in terms of when someone studies and tries to memorize the Quran, the more you learn in terms of knowledge and the more you sacrifice for seeking knowledge, then you see other things being opened up for you. You see other things being opened up for you. So, three benefits, Ikhwani, to summarize that which we've mentioned. Okay, no problem. Ikhwani, inshallah, we'll take five minutes break and then we'll resume with Ibn Allah Ta'ala. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah. So, just to conclude with regards to that which you mentioned in terms of having the taqwa of Allah Azza wa Jal, because the Shaykh at the end he mentions that if you're able to have the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal, then it protects you from a lot of fitr. And then he says, meaning do not be from those that literally leaves us off. Because tafrit is like, you know, you just, you, you let go and you let your wings open and therefore you, you're 
uh, someone where if any sort of trial tribulation comes to you, towards your way, you'll be affected. But rather, you should have yourself as a fortress. Okay, have yourself as a fortress. Have a fortress around yourself. And Husn, you know the Husn Muslim. It's called fortress for a reason. Fortress of, of the Muslim. Why was it called that? And I believe the author chose that name specifically because it makes sense. You're protecting yourself from all the sorts of harm that can come your way with the dhikr of Allah Azza wa Just like the companion that came to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and asked him for advice, he says, اِجْعَلْ لِسَانَكَ رَطْبًا مِنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Keep your tongue moist with the members of Allah Azza wa Even, that's another advice and reminder for myself first and foremost and all those listening, your children, ikhwani, you should teach them afkar in the morning and evening before they go to the toilet, when they come out, when before they go to sleep. All of these things, there may be small things, but they're a means of protection for you, your children, and inshallah your future generation that will come from you. Okay? So, اِجْعَلْ لِسَانَكَ رَطْبًا مِنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ This is something very, very important and crucial. So, if you are from those that does this, and you fear Allah Azza wa Jal, then there are three benefits, and we'll end with these, with these three benefits. The first one that Allah Azza wa Jal will give you that furqan, the ability to differentiate between right and wrong. Ma'asiyah and ta'ah, sin and doing good deeds, harm and benefit. And lastly, the friends of Allah Azza wa Jal and the enemies. That's the first benefit that Allah Azza wa Jal will give you the capability to have this. The second one, يُكَفِّرْ عَنْكُمْ سَيِّعَاتِكُمْ Allah Azza wa Jal will forgive your sins. Allah Azza wa Jal will forgive your sins. That's the second benefit that if you fear Allah, Allah will forgive your sins. Okay? You may fall short, you may make mistakes, but because you fear Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah will forgive you because you return back to Him. And the last one is. So the second one we mentioned that Allah will expiate, sorry, wipe away your sins. The second one, Allah will forgive you, actually forgive you. Because there's a difference, Ikhwani, between Allah wiping your sins away and forgiving you. Okay, and the Shaykh, he. he broke them into two different categories. So the first one is that Allah Azza wa Jal will expiate your sins. And for example, Ikhwani, is that a person does something to you, okay? A person does something. For example, your own child, okay? Your child has done something to annoy you or to, you know, your child is naughty. And what do you do? You wipe away that which they did, meaning you forget about it, but you didn't forgive them. Okay, there's two different things. So here the Shaykh is saying, if you fear Allah Azza wa Jal, you kafir ankum sayyatikum, that Allah Azza wa Jal will wipe away and expiate that specific sin. And also Allah will forgive you for that which you did. Okay, so these are the three things, Ikhwani, that we should take note of with regards to this specific uh, point which was mentioned regarding fearing Allah Azza wa Jal. And what's the verse? Yeah, what's the verse? Uh -huh. In yeah. What's the verse? Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu In tattaqullaha yaj'al lakum furqana The end of the verse Wa yukaffir ankum sayyatikum And then I'm going to explain to you what the Shaykh meant With his own words, not my words, with his own words in terms of the difference of wiping away your sins. So try and memorize that, Ikhwani, and write it down. Wiping away your sins is different to forgiving you. The Shaykh, explains it. He says, if Allah Azza wa Jal forgives his servant, then Allah Azza wa Jal will open doors of knowledge for the person. And look at the verse that Sheikh Naimin uses. Inna anzalna ilayka al-kitab bil-haqq li tahkuma bayna al-nas bi ma araka Allah. Li tahkuma bayna al-nas that you can what? judge between the people bi ma araka Allah. That which Allah Azza wa Jal gave you the capability to see. Okay? Wala takun lil khaibina khasima. So that which is the difference between the two, that Allah will wipe away your sins. Okay, no problem. Allah will wipe away your sins. But Allah forgiving you is he will be able to open doors of ma'rifah doors of knowledge so that you're able to actually be aware and so that you're able to benefit 
in terms of knowing Allah Azza wa and seeking knowledge. And then after this verse, Lil Khaibina Khasima, was Staghfirillah. Shaykh Thameen says straight away when Allah mentioned this, then afterwards, Allah mentions straight away after this ayah, Lil Khaibina Khasima, was Staghfirillah. And ask Allah for forgiveness. That it is, in, 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 it is incumbent and imperative for a person that if look at look at how deep this is. This, this should be written in gold. That if a person is approached for an Islamic verdict for a fatwa, is tuftiya that they should put forward and you qaddim istighfar Allah hatta yubayyin lahu al-haqq li'an Allah qal litahkuma thumma qal wa astaghfirillah Allah rahim Allah shaykh here he mentions and this is the last point we're going to mention that why is it so important for you to ask Allah to forgive you and also wipe away your sins this is the reason because Allah Azza wa Jal will open doors. If Allah forgives you, He opens doors of ma'rifah, i.e. knowledge for you. And then here is an example. The Shaykh says, because of the fact, that's why some ulama, they would say, that if someone comes to you with verdicts, or comes to you to ask you a question, you should ask Allah Azza wa Jal to forgive you. That way, why? Allah Azza wa Jal will bring about clarity so that you can know that which is the truth. I.e. you'll be able to reply with an answer that is upon some sort of knowledge and it's based upon knowledge and that's why and then the, he the sheikh he used the verse they so that you can judge between the two people but then straight away allah used the next verse allah stated the next verse was and to ask allah Azza wa to forgive you what's the reason ikhwani allah says in the quran ar-rahman allam al-quran okay that you no one no one when you think about it no one is self-taught People say, oh, I'm self-taught. I taught myself. Okay? Allah is, insanu ba'if. Allah has created us weak. But when you think about it, Allah Azza wa Jal has given you the capability to have some sort of insight and to have some sort of understanding. Everything comes from Allah Azza wa Jal. So that's why it's known that you should seek forgiveness from Allah Azza wa Jal. And this perfect example is the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How many times did you seek for repentance? 70 to 100 times a day. And he was the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was illiterate. But yet the basira and the knowledge that he had, Allah Akbar. So we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make it of benefit that which we've sat in this gathering. And bi ta'ala, next lesson will go into a very important topic. And with that note, we'll end subhanak Allahumma alhamdulillah, ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayk wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa akhid da'an alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Ikhwani, next week we'll start the same way. This was just a little taster. In terms of, uh, no, no. <laughs> when I say taste, I mean in, t in the beginning, the question. And it is, for me, the main thing, like I mentioned, the main thing is that you you have to have understanding of what you write down. There's no fighter than writing it down. Then I ask you, and you completely lost. If you don't understand the question, that's something else. But you know, they say what well, we used to always be told all the time when we were in Mujamid that understanding the question is half of the knowledge. Understanding the question is half the knowledge. Okay, I won't say the other bit because all of you use it, so I'll leave the other bit that I was going to say because you may use it. But you have to understand the question. So if you don't understand, that's not an issue. But if you've understood the question, but you're not able to remember, it's because you didn't do revision. Just it takes, and that's why we would know as well the ones that are able to benefit more from any sort of uh, sitting down or gathering or reminder are those that are able, that have read before they've come to the lesson. So you read before you come to the lesson what we're going to cover next and you revise that which you've done already. Okay, that's the best way. That's the best way.